I want everyone listening to this podcast to be that ringleader, to live a life that feels courageous, bold, authentic, and real, and just watch the people around you will start to live lives that feel bold, courageous, real, and authentic to themselves as well. Hello, my friends. Welcome to It's All Magic. I am your guide, your host, and your friend, Devin Hine. And here, we'll be discussing how to make your life truly feel like magic. I believe that our very existence on Earth is nothing less than a miracle, and that we all have so much potential to learn, to grow, to experience, and to create during our short time here. It is both my passion and my pleasure to walk this path of life optimization by your side, where we'll discuss topics like passion, purpose, intuition, manifestation, physical well-being, and much, much more. I'm a yoga teacher, a meditation and breathwork facilitator, and a national board certified health and wellness coach. But more importantly, I am an eternal optimist, a lover of life, and a forever student. It is my hope that with each and every episode, you too, will finally start to believe it really is all magic after all. Ready to dive in? Let's do it. Hello, my beautiful friends, and welcome back to another magical episode of It's All Magic. I am so excited to have you with me here today, as I always am. But today we are talking about what I believe is probably the most important topic we've touched on on this podcast yet. That is a grand statement that I've just made. But today we will be talking about the thing you have already seen in the the title, which are the top five regrets of the dying. People laying on their deathbed and recounting what they wish they had done differently in their lives. And by talking about what these regrets are, Those of us that are still living, those of us that are still making conscious decisions every single day about how we want to live the lives we have been granted, it's the greatest gift because we then get to make conscious choices to avoid those regrets and live a vibrant, abundant, fulfilling, love-filled life. So before we get into that topic, I of course want to grant us the opportunity to breathe. Today, we're just going to keep it short and simple. That's kind of what I've been into these days. So we're just going to breathe in through the nose and then open your mouth and just sigh it out. Oh, because it just feels so good. And as you'll see from these regrets that we'll talk about in a moment, I feel like one of the big themes is just keeping life simple. We overcomplicate everything. And so today we're going to start by keeping the breath simple. So if you would like to close your eyes, go ahead and do that now. Maybe placing your palms on your thighs if you get the chance to sit down. And if not, that's perfectly okay as well. Go ahead and just empty out from your previous breath here. Then go ahead, breathe in through the nose, filling up all the way. Open mouth, sigh it out. Beautiful. And again, breathe it in through the nose. Open mouth, let it all go. (sighs) Third one, make noise on this exhale. Inhale through the nose. Open mouth, deep sigh out. (sighs) Hmm, gorgeous. You can flutter open your eyelids if you got the chance to close them. Oh, I feel so good after those three deep breaths. Honestly, it doesn't take much, you guys. We've done all kinds of breathing exercises on this podcast. We have done four, seven, eight breath. We've done equal ratio breath. We have done B's breath. We've done so many, but at the end of the day, just take some simple deep breaths and you will feel like a different person on the other side. So let that be your reminder as we embark on today's topic. So getting right into it, I will kick it off by saying the reason why we're talking about this topic today is because I recently finished, 
I might venture to say one of the greatest books I have ever read because it is wholesome. It is real. It is vulnerable. It is funny. It's inspiring. It's motivating. And that book is called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying, A Life Transformed by the Dearly Departing by Barani Ware. So this book I read because probably about maybe almost a year ago, I listened to Brawny Ware on a podcast, actually on one of my favorite kind of health and wellness podcasts run by Dr. Rong and Chatterjee. I think it's called the Feel Better Live More podcast. And he had interviewed Brawny about her book, obviously, but more specifically about her experiences in life that led her to write the book. So Brawny Ware was decades ago, a young woman who unexpectedly found herself with a career in palliative care. So she started caring for clients in the last 12 or so weeks of their life. So she tended to the dying. She sat with them on their deathbeds. She helped them, of course, shower, go to the bathroom, do all of that. But Mainly her days, her hours were spent sitting by their bedside and hearing about their lives, hearing about their regrets, hearing about what they loved, what they hated, what they wished for, what they dreamt of. And she said those eight years working in palliative care forever changed her life. And I don't know how they couldn't. And some of her clients would even say, you know, why, why do you enjoy talking to me? I'm just, you know, some, some old guy laying in a bed. And she would say, well, you've lived such a full life. You have so much wisdom at this point in the life cycle. Of course, I want to hear what you have to say. So I really, really loved this book. As you could probably tell from the title, it's broken up into the top five regrets of those laying on their deathbed. And then for each of those regrets, each chapter is a different story of one of her palliative care clients. And I have to say, as I was reading this book, I was partially reading this book on a flight recently, and I cried every single chapter because every single chapter ends with this client that you've been getting to know, hearing their stories, hearing their regrets, it ends with them passing away. And just in the few pages within each chapter, you really feel like you get to know each client's heart, each client's desires, their life. And so every time they'd pass away, I would literally sob. So this book really tugged on my heartstrings. But more importantly, if you are an avid listener of this podcast, you probably know that I am a big fan of anything, whether it's a book, a movie, a song that reminds us of what really matters in life because life can move so fast. We all get so busy. We overcomplicate things. We forget what really matters. And so anytime you have a moment to tap back into what really matters in life, love, family, friendships, purpose, joy, play, happiness, all of those things, it just brings a sense of, oh, that's right, back into our lives. And so for me, I have quite a few books and movies that I recommend. If you feel like you could use just a taste of that, oh, right, this is why we're here. These are some of my recommendations. So obviously, books-wise, one of them would be the Top Five Regrets of the Dying by Bronnie Ware. Beyond that, I would recommend three others. One is called The Blue Zones that I've talked about on this podcast. The Blue Zones are the five longevity hotspots in the world, places in the world where people are living to 100 and beyond in far greater proportions than many of us do. So that is a really inspiring and just kind of wholesome book. It reminds you of what the simple good life really looks like. Another book recommendation would be The Tao of Pooh that I've talked about on this podcast. And then the fourth is another book that I've talked about already on this podcast, which is Tuesdays with Maury. So if you need a little dose of inspiration, I would first turn to those four books 
And if you are not in a reading phase or you're just looking for a good movie on a Friday night, then I would recommend the following movies for a dose of inspiration. I would recommend Big Fish, Forrest Gump, Christopher Robin, and About Time. These four movies, every time I see them, just... They just make me feel like life is simple. And that seems to be, I don't know if it's just me. Maybe that's the reminder that we all need all the time. But I feel that because I move very fast, I constantly have new big ideas and dreams and I tend to push myself as many of us do. And so just remembering the good simplicity in life makes it all feel so much better. So that's kind of my introduction today. And with that under wraps, I want to dive into the five regrets of the dying. So for each of these regrets, I'm actually going to explain the regret a little bit. And then I will tell you one of the client stories that she told in the book. For some of them, I will then go ahead and read some quotes or even a small section of the chapter if it was that good and I just couldn't leave it out of this episode. But I feel that by the end of this episode, you will be clear on not only what the top five regrets of most dying are, but what your regrets might be. What in your life feels like it is not serving you? What feels unfulfilling? What feels overwhelming? What feels unsatisfying, misaligned? By the end of this episode, I want you to have those answers so that we, I include myself, do not end up with these regrets on our deathbeds one day. So the top five regrets of the dying are the following. Regret number one is, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself not the life others expected of me. Regret number two is, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Regret number three is, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Regret number four is, I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. And regret number five is, I wish I had let myself be happier. So those are the top five regrets of the dying that Bronnie Ware found in her eight years of palliative care, where she heard the same themes over and over and over from her clients. And she was able to kind of drill them down into these top five regrets. So let's dive in to regret number one. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself not the life others expected of me. So for that regret, she told the story of this client named Grace, who of course was dying. And when Brawny came to care for her, Grace told Brawny her whole story and made Brawny promise that she would live the life that she wanted to live, live a life true to herself, to her own values, to her own heart and soul, rather than what others wanted for her and that was so important for Grace to tell Bronnie that because she had not done that and now she was laying in her deathbed full of regret. So this was Grace's story. So Grace had done everything that was ever expected of her. She had married this young man when she was young. They had had kids. They had been together for 50 plus years. They had the house, the picket fence, etc. And the whole time in her marriage, her husband was kind of a bit of a a tyrant is how she explained him. All she really wanted to do was separate from him, live a simple good life on her own and with her kids and her grandkids and travel. But at least in her generation, it was not acceptable to separate from your husband, to get a divorce. It was all about the family unit no matter what. And so she did what any, quote, good girl would do. And she just shut up and stayed put. And so she lived 50 plus years with this man. And shortly before she ended up meeting Brawny in this book, what had happened is that her husband had actually gotten very sick. 
and he was transported to a nursing home permanently where he would be there. And Grace was secretly celebrating. Even her kids were so glad that he was going to be out of Grace's life, at least not living with her, and Grace would finally have the freedom. She was so excited. She was finally going to travel. She was going to live the life she'd always wanted to live. And then guess what happened? Right as Grace was on her way to the travel agency to book her first book, she started feeling just unwell. And shortly thereafter, she was diagnosed with a terminal disease that ironically was caused by her husband smoking in the house all those years. And so the ironic thing about that is that the one that metaphorically was already killing her. I mean, she really did not like living with her husband. He made her life so unpleasant and miserable. But at the end, he really did kill her. And by her not living a life true to herself, where she had separated from her husband and gone and traveled and all of that, she also killed herself in that way, in this metaphorical sense. And so anyway, she's diagnosed with this disease And within a month, she's bedridden, and so she can't travel. And it's at that point that Bronnie is hired to care for her in her dying days. And as I mentioned, she makes Bronnie promise over and over, you have to live a life true to yourself. It doesn't matter what others want you to do. It doesn't matter what others say. It doesn't matter what they think of your decisions. Because at the end of the day, at the end of a life, There's only one thing that matters, that you lived a life true to yourself. And so Bronnie, of course, promised her, okay, Grace, I will do it. And so anyway, I just wanted to share that story because I heard that actually on the podcast where Bronnie was interviewed when I listened to the podcast months and months back. And that story had stuck with me. Is I feel like it's such a common story where people wait for something to happen, whether they wait to retire or they wait to finally be free of a partner that they're not in love with anymore, whatever it may be. They just wait and they wait and they wait for something to happen, for this, for that. And then sometimes it's too late. And so let Grace's story be a reminder that waiting doesn't have to be part of this game. (laughs) That if you want something to happen, if you feel it in your heart of hearts, then live a life authentic to yourself. And I wanted to touch on two other points related to this regret, which is when you have the courage to live a life authentic to yourself, not only does it serve yourself, but it serves everyone around you because it grants them permission to live a life true to themselves. And I know this from personal experience because from the time I was young, I've been the type of gal that just marches to the beat of my own drum and I very much try to live a life that feels authentic and aligned for me. And I've had so many examples of when I have done something that felt right for me, even if it went against the grain. And as soon as I did that thing, many others would follow suit. So I'll give you two examples. At the end of my high school days, so I had been a competitive dancer most of my life, and in high school, not only was I on my competition dance team, but I was also on my competitive high school dance team, and I was the captain uh, the last two years as well, and so I was a very, very busy gal. On top of that, of course, I had my AP classes, I had my volunteering, I was in organizations. It was a very busy, stressful time of life. And so right before senior year started, I decided I'm no longer having fun balancing all of this, even though it's been my identity for so long. I'm known as the dancer girl. This is what I do. This is who I am. I need to quit my competition dance team. I'll stick with my high school dance team because I love doing that with my friends. I love performing at rallies and basketball games and football games. It's my senior year. 
but I need a little bit of space from the competitive dance world. I want to try out, I don't know, what's that thing that people talk about? Free time? (laughs) And so I ended up leaving my competitive dance studio. And as soon as I did, so many people quit. (laughs) And it's because... We all loved dance, but it was just a highly stressful environment. And many of us were slightly miserable for a lot of the time. So that was one example. Another example, which is quite similar, funny enough, is a few months back when I left my corporate tech job. And I was working within a section of a company where things were just not going well at all. We had had layoffs. We had been just overworked and undermanaged and underpaid for far too long. There were a lot of broken promises. It was honestly a really terrible environment for a very, very long time. And finally, as you all know, listening to this, I had the courage to stand up and quit and decide to, you know, start this journey of podcasting and move to Thailand soon. And as soon as I left, I heard so many other people on my team followed suit and they finally left. And so I say this not to brag about, look at me, I'm I'm always the ringleader here. Not at all. I say this to show that when you live a life that feels real, that feels authentic and aligned, it gives others permission to do the same. For better or for worse, a lot of people need to watch someone else do the thing they really want to do. And as soon as they see that it is possible, they will do it. They will take the leap of faith. But not everyone can do that on their own. And so I want everyone listening to this podcast to be that ringleader, to live a life that feels courageous, bold, authentic, and real, and just watch the people around you will start to live lives that feel bold, courageous, real, and authentic to themselves as well. And that is how we make a more beautiful, satisfying, fulfilling world, I think. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. Another is when you live a life in accordance to your own values, and sometimes that means you will not be in accordance with others' values, people may ridicule your decisions. They may ridicule your behavior, your actions. And when that happens, I just want you to remember this story. So this is a Buddhist story that Brawny shared in the book. It goes like this. A Buddhist story goes that A man came shouting angrily at Buddha, who remained unaffected by him. When questioned by others as to how he remained calm and unaffected, Buddha answered with a question. If someone gives you a gift and you choose not to receive it, to whom then does the gift belong? Of course, it stays with the giver. So I wanted to share that because when people offer their criticisms, their opinions, if they are not in alignment with who you are or what you want, they're not yours. They stay with the person. There doesn't have to be any transference of energy from that person to you. You are in this safe bubble. You are protected by your own courage to live the life you want. And so even when people try to wear you down or make you feel bad for living a life that is actually in accordance with what you want then rather than what society wants, because maybe they didn't have the courage to do that and suddenly they're feeling triggered and envious, you don't have to buy into any of that. That doesn't have to land on you. The gift stays with the giver unless you accept the gift. So just remember that. Best we can do is that we can accept people exactly as they are. We can hold no expectations of them. We might understand that based on their own life experiences, life path, they might not agree with what we're doing. And that's okay because this isn't their life. 
They don't have to agree with it because they don't have to do it. But I have to do it because this is my life and I only have this life to live. So anyway, I could go on and on about that topic because clearly it is near and dear to my heart. If I had honestly just one message in this entire podcast, and I don't mean this entire podcast as in just this one episode, I mean all of its all magic, it would truly be live the life you want to live. Be a good person, contribute to the world, but also don't forget to feel joy, to play, to laugh, to enjoy time with your friends, to enjoy nature, to enjoy freedom. Just live every bit of this colorful human experience and best of all do it your way don't do it the way anyone else tells you to do it do it your way it doesn't matter what anyone else says you got this you got this (laughs) so that's my message from my heart to yours so that was regret number one of the dying i wish i'd had the courage to live a life true to myself not the one others expected of me Moving on to regret number two, which is a big one. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. And Bronnie said that every single male client that she had, male palliative care client she had, said this regret. She said not all of the women did because that generation, most of the women weren't working at that point. But this was an extremely, extremely common regret. And I actually wanted to read you a little snippet from the chapter where she is working with John, who is just this cheeky old man. (laughs) She had started the, the chapter about John where she explained that she was meeting John for lunch and John had actually invited all of his old men friends to the restaurant just to see him be on this date with a young lady. And so all of the men are like watching them on this date. Bronnie just thinks it's hilarious. And uh, Bronnie had made some comment to John about, yeah, of course you guys think I'm, you know, I'm gorgeous. Any woman my age would appear to be an absolute diamond to a group of 89-year-old men. (laughs) So he was just a playful, cheeky, sweet guy. But he had this really sad, very relatable story. I'm sure many people have endured a story like this. So this is his story. Okay, here it goes. Out of the afternoon peace, John stated, I wish I hadn't worked so hard, Bronny. What a stupid fool I was. I worked too damn hard, and now I'm a lonely dying man. The worst part is that I've been lonely for the whole of my retirement, and I need not have been. I listened as he told me the story. John and Margaret had raised five children, four of whom now had children of their own. The other one had died in his early 30s. When all of the children were adults and gone from the home, Margaret had asked John to retire. They were both fit and healthy and had enough money behind them to retire well. He always said they might need more. Margaret replied each time that they could sell their huge, now almost empty house and buy something more suitable, freeing up more money. For 15 years, this battle went on between them while he kept working. Margaret was lonely and longed to discover their partnership again without children or work. For years, she devoured travel brochures, suggesting different countries and regions to visit. John shared the desire to travel and was open to wherever Margaret suggested. Unfortunately, he also enjoyed the status his work gave him. He told me he didn't particularly like the work itself, just the role it gave him in society and among his friends. The chase of closing a deal had also become a bit of an addiction. One evening, with Margaret in tears, begging him to finally retire, he looked at this beautiful woman and realized that not only was she desperately lonely for his company, but they were both old people now. This wonderful woman had waited so patiently for him to retire. Looking at her, she was still just as beautiful as the day that he'd met her, but it was the first time John considered They were not going to live forever. 
Although petrified for reasons he could now not justify, he agreed to retire. Margaret had jumped up and hugged him, her tears switching from sadness to joy. But the smile didn't last long, disappearing the minute he added, in one more year. At that time, there was a new, a new deal being negotiated in the company, and he wanted to see it through. She had waited 15 years for him to retire. Surely she could wait one more. It was a compromise, but one she reluctantly agreed to. As the sun dropped from view, John told me he felt selfish about his choice even then, but he couldn't retire without doing just one more deal. Having dreamt of this time for years, things started to become real for his beloved wife. She made some actual plans and was on the phone to the travel agent regularly. Each night as he wandered in, she would be waiting for him with dinner prepared. As they ate at the table that had once accommodated their whole family, she shared her thoughts and ideas with great excitement. John was starting to warm to the idea of retirement now too, although he still insisted on seeing out the 12 months if Margaret ever suggested otherwise. With four months gone since he agreed to retire and eight still to go, Margaret began feeling queasy. At first, it was a bit of nausea, but after almost a week, it hadn't passed. I've made an appointment with the doctor tomorrow, she told him as he came in from work. The night was already dark. Traffic continued in the distance as other workers headed home. I'm sure it's nothing, though, she said with attempted cheerfulness. While John was concerned she was not feeling well, it didn't cross his mind it could be serious until the following night when Margaret said the doctor had suggested some test. Even if the results had not said so, in the following week, her discomfort increased and the pain told them something was wrong. They just hadn't suspected how wrong. Margaret was dying. Margaret died three months before John was due to retire, though he had retired by then due to her health. John shared how his retirement had been plagued with guilt ever since, even when he was able to come to a certain place of acceptance about his mistake, as he called it. He longed to be traveling and laughing with Margaret now. I think I was scared. Yes, I was. I was petrified. My role had come to define me in a way. Of course, now as I sit here dying, I see that just being a good person is more than enough in life. Why do we depend so much on the material world to validate us? John thought out loud, his random sentences filled with sadness for both past and future generations who wanted everything, basing their importance on what they owned and what they did rather than on who they were in their hearts. There's nothing wrong with wanting a better life, Bronnie. Don't get me wrong, he said. It's just that the chase for more and the need to be recognized through our achievements and belongings can hinder us from the real things, like time with those we love, time doing things we love ourselves, and balance. It's probably all about balance, really, isn't it? So that was John's story, and I just felt the need to read that to you because when I read that, I read it multiple times. I talked to some of my friends about it. I talked to my mother-in-law about it because I was staying at her house at the time, and it just really got to me. Because like I said with the first regret, I feel like that's such, such a common narrative that we wait for a certain time. I mean, think about the American culture that is built on the premise of this American dream. You can make yourself this great life. You can make yourself wealth. You can make yourself famous. You can be known for all that you've done. And all that you've done becomes who you are. That's your identity. And so we work and we work and we work. We grind, 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 hustle, hustle, hustle until some abstract date in the future when we retire. And then the question becomes, what does retirement even mean? Does that mean I'll kick my feet up in Florida and drink pina coladas all day because that would probably get old, especially if you've been hustling and achieving things for decades. I don't think it would be fulfilling to just kick up your feet and drink pina coladas all day. So the point is we work until this abstract idea of retirement, which might not actually even be something you really want. But then what's so sad is that so many people, before they get to that 
golden day of retirement, they lose their health or they lose their partner or in some way they lose the opportunity to live the life they wanted or the life they thought they would want after they had worked for 60 years. And so while I'm not naive enough to believe that we never have to work, we never have responsibilities, I think we don't always have to wait for everything. And I say that as someone who is not impulsive, (laughs) I'm cautious. I think things through. I think things through with every angle in mind. I dream about decisions I'm trying to make. And so I say that through the lens of you don't have to be some crazy impulsive person that quits your job tomorrow and suddenly lives a life true to yourself. But there are ways to create the life you want right here, right now by shifting your perspective, by shifting your priorities, by creating a little bit extra of free time or space in your life to do the things you love, to spend time with those you love. So there are always ways to create more joy and balance in life. It's just up to us to make the decision to do so. So that was regret number two. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Then we move on to regret number three which is, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. And with this regret, it doesn't always mean telling someone you love them, although that's part of it. Another is also the flip side of being able to express when you disagree with someone or if someone in your life has been putting you down for years or they always poo-poo on your ideas on the decisions you make that are authentic to you being able to express your discontent with those objections your anger your frustration your sadness your loneliness being able to express it all because truly Having the courage to be vulnerable is the most human thing. And I think it's also the thing that makes the human experience so colorful and rich. So we have to have both courage and vulnerability to live this full human experience. And so that was one of the regrets she heard a lot from these people lying on their deathbeds who felt like they had never really expressed how they felt. So my favorite story from that was this old man named Charlie. And he had these two grown children, Greg and Marianne, who were constantly there checking in on him, talking to Brawny. And those two grown children, Greg and Marianne, were constantly fighting. It's as if the stress of their father's looming death was just creating a whole lot of disharmony, disconnection, kind of the the issues that had been brewing for decades between them, resentment that the son Greg had for his sister Marianne because she had actually lived a life authentic to herself and he had not. It was suddenly brewing and he felt like, he deserved to receive more from his father after his father died than his sister did because his sister, you know, never stuck around to care for his, her dad. Uh, She just, you know, moved away from home. And so there was just a lot of resentment bubbling up. And one day Bronny was sitting with Charlie and Charlie was explaining that, you know, it makes him sad to see his kids fight, but he also knows this has been a long time coming. So he's hoping they can work it out. And he said, I really don't worry about my daughter, Marianne. I mean, she, you know, moved away from home and she lives a really happy life. She's doing well for herself, but most importantly, it's a happy life. And that's all I care about as a parent. He said, but Greg, Greg seems like he's not living a happy, healthy, simple life as I would want him to. It seems like he's constantly trying to prove himself to me, to whoever, that he's working these long, long hours at a job he hates. Then he comes home to children he barely even sees, and he's just constantly trying to prove himself. He's he's working so hard, and nothing is coming from it. And he said, if there's just one thing I want him to do, one thing I want him to know from my passing is that my wish for him 
is that I just want him to be happy. I wish he didn't work so hard. I wish he spent more time with his children. I wish he just chose a simpler, happy, healthy life. And Bronnie had said to him, well, it's so interesting you keep saying he's trying to prove himself. Does he know that you love him? And Charlie said, well, I mean, I don't think I've ever used those words, but, you know, I often tell him I think he's doing a good job. And she said, no, Charlie, does he know that you love him? And so she convinced Charlie that he had to tell his son before he passed that he really loved him. And so I just want to read part of that chapter to you because it's a tearjerker. So she had left Charlie and his son Greg alone one afternoon. She had even asked the daughter Marianne to please come a different day. Greg needed some time with Charlie. So this is the little bit that I want to read to you. Not long before Greg was due to leave so his dad could rest, they called me in. Greg's eyes were bloodshot from crying and they were holding each other's hand. Bronny, I just want you to know too, Charlie announced. I love this man with all of my heart. He is a good son and a great man. At this, of course, I almost cried. My son is already enough, Charlie said. There is nothing for him to prove. There is nothing he needs to do or have to become a better person. I love this man sitting here completely and being his father has brought my life great joy. Oh my God, that's like making me tear up. So, uh, okay, get your stuff together, Devin. (laughs) So that was such a beautiful section to me because Charlie was then able to have a similar conversation with his daughter, Marianne. And in his last days, there was so much love that was just shared between him, his son, his daughter, his son and daughter started just mending their rifts as well. And the amount of love in the house was palpable, according to Bronnie. But just hearing that Charlie had never really told his son that he loved him and that All he wanted was for him to be happy, that he didn't have to do anything to prove himself. And so many of us feel that we have to do something to prove ourselves. We feel that we need to make a name for ourselves or accomplish something specific when really just being ourselves, being a good person and doing your best with whatever lot you have in life, that's all that really matters. And though I'm not a parent myself, I'm obviously someone's child and from my own parents, I know that to be so true that we all like to create some sort of narrative of who we have to be or what we have to do to receive love. And at the end of the day, it's not true at all. We can be loved just for being exactly who we are. So that was regret number three. I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Then regret number four. This one is so sweet too. Oh my gosh, this one made me cry a whole lot. Regret number four. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. So the story for this one that made me cry so many tears. This was such a sweet chapter. Was about this old woman, Doris, who was in a nursing home. And Bronnie had even said in the book that she tried very hard not to work in nursing homes because she thought they were poorly run. She thought they were depressing. There were just a whole lot of sad, lonely, elderly people in them. A lot of people that had just been dumped there um, really out of no reason other than it's just easier to, to put them away. So she really hated nursing homes, but she did a few volunteer shifts at this one nursing home. And one day, Bronnie walked into this woman Doris's room. She hadn't met Doris before. And as soon as she walked in, Bronnie had her normal bright smile and just said, Hi, Doris. How are you doing today? And Doris saw her smile and saw how heartfelt her question was. And she started sobbing. And Bronnie said, Honey, what's wrong? And Doris just said that she was 
dying of loneliness in there that so many of the staff members were not nice to the the elderly clients at all and that there was no love there was no real communication no connection and she was so lonely even with all these people around there was no one that cared to know her or cared to understand her and so she just cried and Bronnie held her hand and Bronnie said how about I come and visit you every day and we can sit down and we can chat and Doris said oh don't waste your time no go out and live your life you're young and Bronnie said no this is exactly what I want to be doing I want to be spending this time with you so Bronnie started visiting Doris every day and every time she'd visit Doris, Doris would hold her hand the whole time because she said she was just starved for human touch. That's really all she wanted. And so she'd sit there holding Bronnie's hand. And one day she said to Bronnie that she was just so lonely in the nursing home, not only for the reasons I said, but she only had one daughter. Her daughter lived very far away, so she didn't get to see her much. And she'd really lost touch with all of her friends. And Bronnie said, well, why don't we try to reach out to them? And Doris said, oh, I don't even know how I would find them. And Bronnie thought, oh, I really want to help you with this. There's now the internet. I can help you find these, these friends. And so Doris finally said, okay. And she wrote down the names of four of her best friends from the days past. And so Bronnie, you know, went to the internet and started looking up the friends and finding everything she could about them. Of course, after Doris had told her all the stories about all of her friends and she had found out of those four, two of Doris's friends had already passed on. One of them had recently suffered a stroke and could no longer speak. So Bronnie had Doris write a, a little note for her friend that couldn't speak and they delivered the note and then it was so sweet that woman's son called Bronny and said that he had just given the note to his mom and even though the mom couldn't make any sound anymore she lit up when she read this note from her dear old friend Doris it was like she was just a young girl again so excited so that was so sweet and then the fourth friend they were having so much trouble finding Finally, though, Bronnie found her. Her name was Lorraine, and she was able to find through an old neighbor of hers. The neighbor told Bronnie where Lorraine had moved. It was this whole Nancy Drew mystery game, but she finally found her. And when Bronnie called Lorraine one day, Lorraine picked up her own phone with this friendly, elderly voice, and Bronnie explained who she was, why she was calling, that Lorraine's dear old friend Doris was here in a nursing home and would love to connect with her and Lorraine lit up and said yes please give her my number and so anyway Bronnie you know hung up the phone and said Doris I found Lorraine and she gave me her phone number would you like to call her and Doris was like a little kid in a candy shop are you are you serious yes I want to I want to call Lorraine and so Bronnie you know plugged in the the phone number for Doris and handed her the phone and said, okay, as soon as your your call goes through, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave you to it. And Doris said, okay, okay, thank you so much. And Doris and Lauren connected on the phone and Ronnie, you know, left. But she kind of listened through the door for a few minutes. And she said, even though she could hear these two elderly voices, the second they were talking to each other, it was as if they were two teenage girls again, making inside jokes, giggling, laughing about the good old days, and it warmed her heart so much. And so Lorraine and Doris had this lovely chat together. You know, Bronnie left that day, and later that evening, Bronnie got a call from the nursing home saying that Doris had passed away that afternoon. And so I just felt like oh, the story was not only so both sad and sweet, but the fact that Doris passed away having had a moment of real connection with someone that shares a history with her. Because that's what they talked about in that chapter. They, they kept saying that you can be lonely and be surrounded by people, but loneliness comes from not being with people that get you, that know you, 
that know your history, that know your heart, that understand you. And so for Doris, even though she was surrounded by people all the time, it wasn't the same at all as one phone call with her old friend, Lorraine. And just the fact that after that call, Doris passed away peacefully. It's as if that was the last thing she needed on earth before she went to the other side. So, wow, I just feel shaky from talking about all these chapters, all of these sweet clients, but it was really a a wholesome client story and just the whole concept about losing touch with friends. I feel that especially in today's fast-paced society, friendships often get put on the back burner because people are busy with work or their families or traveling or doing whatever and we lose touch or there's just long distance between your friends and it's hard to to stay in touch when everyone has their own lives, their own families, their own jobs. But it this book really drilled home the point that when you are finally laying on your deathbed one day, that's when everyone suddenly misses their friends. Because again, at the end of the day, at the end of a life, all that matters is that you are surrounded by those who love you and those that you love in return. So you can imagine being all alone in a sad nursing home with no one that knows you, no one that really, really cares about you. That's why as soon as Brawny went into Doris's room and said with a smile, hi, honey, how are you today? Doris broke down because she hadn't felt that true love, that true care for so long. So no matter how busy any of us are in our lives, it's worth a text, a phone call to an old friend just to say, hey, thinking about you, how are you? I miss you. It doesn't take a lot, but it'll make all the difference. And then one day down the road, whether we each get five years more, 50 years more, somewhere in between, we will be surrounded by those that love us and those that we love. So that was regret number four. I wish I hadn't lost touch with my friends. Fifth and final regret, regret number five, I wish that I had let myself be happier. This one is so powerful because Brawny, the author, is a deeply spiritual person and she kept talking about, and a lot of these clients ended up agreeing with her, she kept talking about how happiness is a choice. And no matter how busy we are, no matter how stressed we are, no matter what we have going on in life, yes, of course, there are going to be very difficult, challenging, tumultuous times in life. But for the most part, Happiness is simply a choice that we have to make. It is a perspective shift. It is a moment of having gratitude for everything that's going right. Because we all know that even on our toughest days, on the days where you are stressed from work, on the days where you've gotten in an argument with a family member or a friend, there's still so much going for you. It's still as if everything is rigged in your favor, even if you can't see it right now. So just living your life from the perspective that, hey, at least I have air in my lungs. At least I have these two legs that I get to walk on. At least I have eyes to see the beauty of this world. At least I have a mouth to express my truth, ears to hear others' truths, a nose so I can smell delicious smells in this world. There's so many good things that we all have. And just taking a moment to be grateful is enough to make us happy. So that's just kind of Brawny's perspective. But I wanted to talk about one of the clients that had that regret of I wish I'd let myself be happier. And that client was Kath, who was only 51 years old when Brawny cared for her. She was abruptly diagnosed with a terminal illness and started going downhill fast. And I personally really connected with Kath because she had always been a student of philosophy and spirituality. She was a deep thinker, a big question asker. And so she had 
thought about concepts like manifestation and gratitude and energy and frequencies and vibrations long before I ever even existed. And so I really enjoyed hearing Kath's kind of spiritual philosophical takes on life. But there was this one part about wishing that she had let herself be happier that really stuck with me that I would love to read for you. Okay, here we go. This is what Kath said. And as a preface to this, what I do remember from this chapter is that Kath had finally found her calling a little later in life. She had worked a corporate job for many decades that was fine. She said she liked it well enough, but probably somewhere around mid-age, middle age, she started volunteering and truly found her life's calling and purpose. So she switched her whole career, started working at nonprofits, and she loved it. And even with that purpose, even with getting to wake up every day with that calling in mind, this is what she said. We all have a positive contribution to make. I've made mine, but while I was searching for my purpose in life, I forgot to enjoy myself along the way. It was all about the result of finding what I was looking for. Then when I did find work I loved, work I could do with the heartfelt intention of contributing, I was still results-based. I robbed myself of potential happiness. That's what I mean when I say I would do it differently. It's important, sure, to work towards finding your purpose and contributing to the world in any capacity, but depending on the end result for your happiness is not the way to do it. Gratitude for every day along the way is the key to acknowledging and enjoying happiness now. Not when the results come in or when you retire or when this or that happens. So that was Kath's perspective. And I thought that was so powerful because we so often hear stories and there were many stories of this in the book as well of people who just hated their job and never let themselves be happy because they were just always stressed and miserable and it was just such a hard life. But then you hear this story from a woman named Kath who is this cheerful, jovial lover of spirituality and life and philosophy. She had such a curiosity and a zest for life. I really resonated with her and She had a calling in life. She had work that she loved, that contributed to the world. And yet, even having a purpose, if you wake up every day and you love what you do, there is still a way to find balance and joy outside of your work in the world. Because as I've even heard Bronnie say on other interviews, That when you fully identify with work, no matter how purpose-led it is, no matter how much you love it, when that work is gone, your identity is gone. You don't know who you are anymore. You don't know what you stand for. You don't know what your worth is. If your entire worth is tied up with how much you accomplish, what you do, what you are known for, then when all of that is gone... There's nothing left. And I really think the most important is always what's in our hearts, who we are, not what we do. And that's really hard in America because what we do becomes who we are. But I am here to say, I think we can make it another way. And we can do that starting with ourselves, finding a little bit more balance in life, no matter how much you love your job or not. There's always ways to uh, just have more variety in life than just being a one trick pony. You have work and then you, you go to sleep and you have work and you go to sleep. There's always more in life. There's so much to enjoy in life. What a freaking gift to be here. Oh my gosh. It just makes me so excited when I really think about it. <laughs> so That was regret number five. I wish I had let myself be happier. So just remembering that at the end of the day, it's a choice and we can all find a little bit more balance, a little more vibrance, a few more hobbies, a few more friends, a bit more travel. Add a little color and richness to your life outside of work, even if you love what you do. 
So those are the five regrets. I'm going to just run through them quickly now. And as I say each one, I just want you to think to yourself if that is a regret you might have, if that one rings true for you or resonates in some way. So the top five regrets of the dying are the following. Number one, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Regret number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Regret number three, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Regret number four, I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. Regret number five, I wish I'd let myself be happier. So those are the top five regrets of the dying based on Bronnie Ware's book and her eight years of palliative care with clients. But that doesn't necessarily mean that those are the regrets that you resonate with or that you might have. So what I want you to do after this episode, or maybe you've already been doing it while listening to this, is really decide for yourself. If you were to pass away tomorrow or tonight in your sleep or this week, this weekend, next month, if that happened and you knew it were happening, what is the thing that you would regret? What is the thing that you always wanted to do that you never did? Or in what ways did you work too hard? In what ways did you lose track of your friends or lose touch with the ones that you love? In what ways did you keep yourself from being happier? So really ask yourself these questions based on those five regrets. What would you regret in your own life? And then once you know that this is the key part, How can you make the change now so that when you lay on your deathbed peacefully decades and decades and decades and decades and decades from now and you're surrounded by all of your friends and all of your family and it's the most beautiful, gentle, peaceful passing, how can you lay there and have no regrets? What will it take for you to feel that you have truly lived not only a fulfilling, accomplished life, but a happy one. One filled with so much love and laughter and joy because those are so important. They are just as important to the accolades, the accomplishments, the fame, the contributions to the world. It's both about the inner and the outer, the self-joy and the contributions to the outer world. So that is my question for you, just to really think through your own potential regrets and how you can make changes in your life now so that you don't one day have those regrets. And I'll leave you with this last quote by Bronnie. She said, don't worry about the little stuff. None of it matters. Only love matters. If you remember this, that love is always present, it will be a good life. So I wanted to leave you with that because as we talked about at the beginning, it really is so much simpler than we ever pretend it to be. We overcomplicate things, but at the end of the day, it's just about love, isn't it? So with that, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being open-hearted, open-minded, curious, resilient, courageous, beautiful. I see you and I am so happy to be here with you. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to rate and review this show anywhere you find your podcast, whatever platform, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, you name it, and I'm there. Um, Also, please find me on YouTube at Devin Rochelle Hines so that you can watch these if you are a visual person. And come follow me on Instagram at It's All Magic Podcast. And then my other Instagram is Devin underscore Rochelle underscore. Okay, I believe that's it. (laughs) Again, I love you. I really hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed reading the book and prepping these notes for you. Until next week, my friends. I already can't wait to see you. (laughs) Goodbye for now. Goodbye for now.